Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. Today we're going to do something uh, a bit different and not within, not within the framework really of mindfulness. The cultivation of loving thought is a very, is a very useful factor of mind to develop for the, for the practice of insight. When love is highly developed in the mind, the mind gets very very flexible, very pliable, very soft and gentle and workable. And the awareness and clarity can then be very sharp, very smooth, very, very easy. It's as if the mind has been tempered by this quality of love so that then a very penetrating awareness can be applied. There is a special kind of meditation which deals specifically with the development of loving kindness, of of universal love. And it's a very nice thing to incorporate into one's practice, to begin each meditation with five or 10 minutes of developing that kind of mind. It sets sets one up for for then developing a very sharp wisdom with regard to what's happening because it makes the mind very open, very receptive. So what we'll do today is just to to explain a little bit of how to cultivate these loving thoughts. There are two different kinds of practices. One is to use loving kindness as an object of a concentration meditation. Okay, it's a mantra. You can do mantra and visualization with, with loving kindness and develop very high states of samadhi. You can go into the jhanas or trances using love as the object. That's, we're not primarily concerned with that, but rather to develop a general kind of loving kindness, right? The kind of loving thought which just makes the mind so, so gentle and soft and open. And that's done by simply sitting down and repeating certain kinds of phrases, for example, may all beings be happy, may all beings be peaceful, may all beings be liberated, may all beings be free of suffering. Whatever words you feel are appropriate to yourself in sending out to all beings everywhere, should be repeated three or four of these phrases. You sit down with a very quiet mind, just sending out these loving thoughts, really imagining going out into the universe, right? May all beings everywhere be happy. May they all be peaceful. May all beings be free of suffering. May all beings be enlightened. Repeating that for five or 10 minutes, you really begin to open up. Right? The mind gets very, very open, very full of love. And then after about five or ten minutes of doing this, again, one should just sit quietly and use that, that, that quality of mind which has developed through this practice of love, that very receptive state, very open state, and then practice mindfulness. And you'll find it much easier. You'll find yourself much more open much more receptive to what it is that's happening moment to moment. Interesting, the development of loving kindness involves a concept. That is the concept of other beings, right? of other persons to whom you're sending out these loving thoughts. In ultimate reality, there's no such thing as person or man or woman. All we are is a collection of elements, which is why the development of this loving kindness by itself does not penetrate to that underlying state of wisdom. 
because it's dealing with a concept. But it's a very beautiful concept and a very beautiful state of mind arises from the cultivation of this love and kindness. So we use it, right? We use that, that kind of meditation to develop the mental factor of love. Love also being not I and not mine and not self. It's an impersonal mental factor. But we can develop it because it has a very wholesome influence on the mind. And then when the mind is suffused with this kind of loving thought, loving vibration, we then balance that, that love or devotional quality with the development of wisdom. Right? We use that space of mind and then, and then develop a very sharp, penetrating insight into the ultimate nature of things. So they're a very beautiful complement and necessary complement to one another. Are there any questions? Is this the practice that you did when, is that the particular practice that you did when you felt really good and you went to your teacher and said that will pass too? I was doing it as a, a the, more sp the first kind of practice I mentioned, as a specific concentration technique involving involving visualization and and the, the words like what we'll do here is is a more general kind for sending out loving thoughts right its purpose is not primarily to reach high states of samadhi but just to to make the mind light right light and flexible and open and it's very beautiful because you get established in a very easy relationship with people when this quality of loving kindness is developed, just with whomever you with whomever you happen to be, that metta or, or loving kindness is there. You know, wishing happiness for all beings. It, it's very nice. Are there any questions? Uh, you sit in like a meditation position. And your leg hurts and you you can. Sometimes it's good to make the pain the object of the meditation. Right? And just watch it. It's that way we get over our fear of pain. You know, it's just a flow of unpleasant sensation. So if we're mindful of it with a relaxed mind, actually pain is a good object because it's very strong and the mind doesn't wander. You know? But when it gets unbearable. That's when you should note the intention to move and the moving. You might, it might be easier if, if you sat on a cushion. Isn't the loving kindness meditation? Should you use just, may all be, be happier, should you use several ones? Use three or four. Like, may all beings be happy, may all beings be peaceful, may all beings be enlightened or free of suffering. Whatever, you know, whatever feels right to you. And in whatever rhythm. You know, whatever choice of words you choose. But you should keep the same ones because then it's a mantra-like effect, right? And it develops the samadhi, the one-pointedness on love, on loving thought. So it gets strong. Well, are they repeated over and over during the during meditation or is it just saying it to yourself three or four times and then... No, it's saying it for about five or ten minutes. And, and then drop it. Then... But the effect on the mind will be there, right? The mind will be very much opened up. And then just go back to the mindfulness. Because that's what's going to develop wisdom, right? In this one, we should not visualize. That's another way. Sometimes if you, if you want to direct it towards a, a particular person, you can do that also. But that should be included. There should also be the universal sending out. You know, to really open up to, to all beings. So you can combine them. Any other questions? When you do this metta meditation, this meditation on loving kindness, before the sitting, when you sit down, it sets up the mind, puts the mind in a very nice place for the practice of insight. When you end with it, the force of the loving thoughts are much stronger because you have already built up a certain strength of concentration. Right? So when you're generating thoughts of love, 
there's a greater power in it. It also, it also puts the mind in a good relationship aspect to other people. So that when we get up from the sitting, if we have just done a few moments of sending out, may all beings be happy, it's a nice way of relating to people. So as we get up from the meditation, it, it puts us in a good place. You can do both. You can do it in the beginning and the end, or if you prefer one or the other, it doesn't matter. One other practice, which is very nice and helpful, which is nice to do before, in the beginning of each sitting, often in the course of a day, we may have even knowingly or unknowingly hurt someone or offended someone or done something unwholesome or unskillful. It's very nice when we sit down just to mentally ask forgiveness if we have hurt anyone in thought, in word, or in deed. And also to extend forgiveness if anyone may have hurt or offended us. So just when you sit down, either before the metta or after it, you can just mentally, mentally say, if I have hurt anyone or offended anyone in thought, word, or deed, I ask forgiveness. And I freely forgive anyone who may have offended me. Sort of clears the slate. You know, anything that, any negativities that may have arisen in the course of a day, you just sort of acknowledge the possibility of them and, and clean them from the mind, clear them from the mind. It's very nice. It just it makes the mind very light. Also, actually, it's interesting when you do metta as a specific meditation, not as the way we were doing it, but as a, as a particular samadhi practice, you begin with yourself. To give you an idea of how to keep these different practices in perspective, you know, it's very meritorious, very purifying to offer food or clothes, to offer a gift to someone. And the force of that purity is greatly increased if the person you're giving it to happens to be enlightened or very pure themselves. So a gift to the Buddha or, and or many enlightened beings is a very highly meritorious act. It's very productive of, of good fruit, good effect, good result. The Buddha said that cultivating loving thought for even a single moment is many times more fruitful, more purifying than if one had offered food and, and robes to the Buddha himself and the whole order of monks. So powerful is the generation of a single moment of true loving kindness. It's very powerful. Many times more powerful than the developing of loving kindness is for one instant, one moment, to experience the impermanence of all phenomena. To see how everything is arising and passing away. To experience that fully for one moment is many times more powerful than even the development of loving kindness. Because the seeing of impermanence is the beginning of freedom. It's the beginning of getting off the wheel. Not only getting to a very high place, which is what happens in the development of metta, a very beautiful place, but in seeing impermanence and in developing insight, it's a taste of freedom. That's why in the practice, we should develop the thoughts of love and kindness and send them out. But the main thrust of the practice should be in the development of this very penetrating awareness, penetrating insight into the nature of all phenomena, into the nature of the processes, because that's what leads to enlightenment. All these other wholesome states of mind which can be cultivated like love and compassion and happiness in the joy of others are all very, very useful in setting up the mind, in, in softening the mind, in opening us up for the development of insight. 
but we, we should understand that it's the wisdom which comes from from understanding the process that leads to leads to understanding and freedom. Well, if everything is impermanent, then the inside of the wisdom will permanent. Absolutely, it's a means to go beyond. Enlightenment is the the going beyond of this mind body process, and the way to that state beyond the mind and body is through the development of the understanding of the process. That's why there's no, there should be no identification with wisdom. Oh, I'm so wise. You know, that's not the path anymore. Because wisdom itself is just another mental factor. It's impersonal. It's not self. It has a certain function. Its function is to bring the mind to a state of balance which can intuit nirvana or, or the ending of the process. There's no place for attachment any, anywhere at all, not to love, not to wisdom, not to mindfulness, to remain unattached to all these processes, but cultivating those which are going to take us beyond them. You know, they give the story of you come to a river and you want to cross to the other side. So you build, you build yourself a raft, okay? And you get all the wood and the rope and you build the raft. You use it. And you cross on the raft to the other side of the river. When you get to the other side, you don't carry the raft around on your head. It served its purpose. So you leave it there and then go on. In the same way, we don't, all of the things that we're cultivating are only a means to cross to the other shore, right? They're not carried, they're not carried beyond that. But you don't want to give up the raft in the middle of the river. You know? <coughs> Are there any other questions? It's okay, that, that very that very practice of asking for and and giving forgiveness is a way of weakening man, you know, weakening the, the hold of anger on the mind. It still may be there and it may come up in the meditation. In which case, the anger itself should be made the object of the of the mindfulness. Really observing it without identifying with it, right? Without taking it to be self. But that practice of asking forgiveness and the loving kindness is a very great antidote to anger. You know? It's hard to be angry when you're when you're asking forgiveness. <laughs> I've got a fundamental difficulty in somehow. At the time of thinking, that's what when the thought is there, you should be aware of the thought and not with the breath. And then follow the it, you will see that if you are mindful of the process, that is thinking, 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 rather than involved in an analysis of content, you will see the thought come and go very quickly. Thoughts continue in the mind for a long time only when we get involved in them, right? As soon as we're mindful, you'll see it comes and goes, and then back to the breathing. Mm -hmm. Sleepiness is hard. It's a very subtle object and it's hard to be mindful of it. It's a good training, you know, to try and establish mindfulness on that state. If you find yourself losing, you know, that the sleepiness is really overpowering the mind. There are a few things to do. One is you can do some intentionally hard breathing, right? 
if the situation is appropriate and you really are feeling very, very drowsy, you can get up and do some of the walking meditation, which stimulates the energy factor. You, know, you can throw cold water on your face. And if nothing works, you go to sleep. <laughs> Having a hard time distinguishing between effort and forcing. And forcing my mind. You can't force the mind to be concentrated. All you can do is make the effort to stay mindful, right, of what it is that's happening. But everything that we're cultivating now is exactly to find that balance between making an effort and not not causing tension in the mind, right? Well, shall I not then, if my mind wants to wander, shall I let it No, if the, it's not to fight the thought process. You know, it's not to, not to think that thoughts are bad and shouldn't be there. If thoughts are coming merely to be aware that the mind is thinking, right? Don't struggle with trying to stand the breath and pushing the thoughts away. If thoughts are what's happening, be aware of the fact that you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And then when the thought disappears, again back to the breath. In other words, the effort is at mindfulness, not at having any particular object. But rather, whatever it is that comes, to be mindful of it. I know that we mentioned in this class that phrase of Milarepa about hastening slowly. Right? That's that balance. You want to be really going forward very mindfully, very carefully. You want to be making an effort without forcing, without straining. There are no results to look for. There is nothing to look for because the whole, the whole aim is simply to be mindful moment to moment, not to have any particular state happen. Right? Because all states are impermanent. So why look for any of them? Expectation is a big hindrance. And if the mind is expecting, that very expecting mind should be made the object of the meditation. Now look at it, expecting, expecting, or anticipating, so as not to get caught up in it, not to identify with it, because it throws the mind off balance. Maybe the last question. Have, when we're aware that I'm thinking, thought comes, as soon as I go thinking, thinking, the thought is real behind it, concentration on the process, Thinking. Now, one thing that the intent is to go through the thought, let it come up, recognize it. There's something that happens. As soon as I start saying thinking, thinking, the thought gets mixed up with the process. No, at the moment you're saying thinking, thinking, the thought is no longer there. Right. And so, is that the goal to just like, take away the energy from inside? Right. Right, exactly. And not to go into the thought and right. give it a full Sometimes you'll find that. If a thought has a lot of power behind it, even when you're saying thinking, thinking, you know, it goes on to the end. That's okay if you're staying aware that oh, the, the thinking process is going on, right? Sometimes when you become mindful of it, it disappears immediately. Depends on the, the push behind it. It doesn't matter. The idea is to stay mindful of whatever it is that happens. If it disappears, fine, back to the breathing. If it plays itself out, fine, if there's no involvement with it. And not getting involved in the content, but just aware that, oh, thinking, thinking, all the way to the end. You can get enlightened in the middle of a thought. Just right in the middle, if the mind is perfectly balanced. So it's not that we're trying to do away with thoughts, but simply to be aware that that's what's happening. Speaking of the place of the second, have you found your own experience and the experience of those you studied with in India, that after a while, it sort of, you just get the hang of it, and as much effort as was at first entailed isn't entailed anymore. Oh, absolutely. When the mindfulness is developed, it becomes effortless. It just starts working by itself, and all you do, you don't do anything. You just sit down, and automatically, it's there. It's like when a very, a very great pianist, when he sits down to practice, he does not make an effort to play. It all happens because he has developed this proficiency, right? 
when the mindfulness is well cultivated, it's just there, it's working, and it goes on by itself. And it's best to have a teacher to work with, and if not, what's the In an intensive retreat, which is the best way to cultivate it quickly, it's helpful to have a teacher. Because the mind has a tendency to get caught up in a lot of in a lot of places. Yeah. Some people don't need it, you know, depending on your past background and your understanding. Generally, it's helpful. As far as a, a general practice is concerned of sitting a couple of hours a day, maybe. You can you can do very well by yourself. If you don't deliberately practice mindfulness, will mindfulness occur anyway? Mindfulness only occurs if you're mindful. The more moments you're mindful, the more moments in the future mindfulness is liable to arise. Which is why all this is is a practice in mindfulness. Right? It's practicing that state of mind. It does not drop down from heaven. But it does not mean that you can only develop mindfulness if you're sitting. You can develop, mindfulness can be developed on any object at any time. It means being aware of what's happening. Without identifying with it and without clinging and without condemning. Just being open and receptive, noticing each object as it comes. We're, we're, we're trying to understand is it seems that mindfulness would be a natural state of mind that you know, after some things some extra things are taken away the mindfulness will occur I mean, is that the case well the extra things being taken away are only taken away through mindfulness the extra things being greed hatred and delusion which are big clouds in the mind but we're very conditioned to that we're very conditioned to clinging and condemning and being unaware. That's what we're bringing to the present moment, that kind of conditioning. To decondition the mind, to free the mind of those, of those negative forces, takes an effort to be mindful. Right? When they're gone, then mindfulness, then mindfulness is automatic. But mindfulness is the way to get rid of them. So it has to be cultivated. When all meditation practices be Mindfulness or is there only one? No, mindfulness means noticing the process of things, right? That's one kind of meditation. Another kind is the development of concentration, which means developing one pointedness of mind. And they're two different factors. And very many meditation techniques involve this concentration that is, mantra and visualization, or a light or a sound. So making the mind one pointed on a single object. That leads to very high states of consciousness. It does not lead to insight into the process. It's mindfulness which leads to that moment-to-moment -moment understanding of what's happening. There are many different ways to develop mindfulness, many different techniques. But the, the technique is not what's important. It's the state of mind being developed. You said in terms of thoughts, if you're thinking, you think thinking, and then you go back to the breathing. What if it's something like feeling? How far, how deep do you go? Do you think we're anger and, or contentment and then move on? Or, I mean, how far you, do you, you go? You stay you? with, the rule is to be with what's predominant, as long as it's predominant, right? As long as the anger is the strongest thing happening. So be mindful of it, anger, anger, anger. You know, if it's, if it's a feeling or a thought, whatever, whatever the mind is drawn to because of predominance, then we should be mindful. Everything is impermanent. So when the mindfulness is sharp, you're going to see that everything is just arising and vanishing. And then back to the breathing. After a while, it gets very rhythmic. Just automatically, the mind is drawn to all these different objects because they're strong. And the mindfulness is right with it. You know, it's very flowing, very easy. But that takes a certain momentum of mindfulness to be built up. And that's what we're doing here. So that's the training to, to increase the frequency of noticing. Right? So the frequency gets greater and greater, picking up 
more and more instantaneously what's happening until it all starts happening by itself. They complement one another in the sense that you can use a highly concentrated mind to develop. Right. And then it's very easy. The people with high samadhi who then do insight, then practice insight, they don't have our struggles, you know, because the mind is so powerful that. But concentration by itself does not lead to it. It has to be used. Instead of being mindful of them, it seems like I get more caught up in what I get by them. Um, at that point, should I like stay with me? Well, that's why the labeling in the beginning is helpful. That's why the labeling is helpful in the beginning. Because it gives you some distance. No. If, you, if you're making a mental note of thinking, thinking, or anger, anger, whatever, whatever it is, it aids the mindfulness, the non-identification. Right? When, that, when that mindfulness is strong, the labeling falls away. You don't need it. But in the beginning, it's a big help. In your experience with the cultivation of mindfulness, how do you um, frequency um, things to be mindful of increase? I'm wondering if, if by sitting and doing it regularly, if you condition yourself to a quiet place. The, qui the quietness is not in, in the object, but in the mind, the mind observing it. And what happens is you, you experience much more. There's a flood of things happening, but with a silent mind, without any reaction. You're not clinging and you're not condemning. So it's just this river flowing by, but the mind is perfectly balanced. You become aware of many more things as the mind gets quiet. You know, there are many thoughts which are just whispers in the mind, just, just hardly perceptible, which normally are well below our threshold of awareness. You know, as the mind gets quiet, those become very clear. And many things in the body also. But the mind stays balanced. Um, sometimes I can put in the label. You know, I don't want to label. And I guess I mean, I can start thinking, thinking of labels or thinking, you know, but I don't. I'm sort of like, that. <laughs> The pleasure, I mean, is that pain or is that not pain? You no, know, the, label, the labeling is secondary. It's the mindfulness which is important. So don't. First, if you, if you find it not helpful, there's no need if you're staying mindful. Right? If you're using the labeling, don't get too involved with finding exactly the precise word. Just you. Uh, Sort of fits upon very general words which which will fit most situations for example there are many kinds of thoughts and for some people it's useful to label precisely what kind of thought such as remembering or planning or imagining or fantasizing or whatever a particular kind of mind is very in tune with that kind of precision of labeling it's not necessary though if you're just aware of thinking thinking it serves right the same way with bodily sensations. Fix upon just one or two general labels, because it's only an aid to keep the mind on the object. That's all. It's not the concept is not important at all. <laughs> Anything. The important thing is to experience fully what's happening, to experience the process, the arising and passing away. To meditation in the sort of a, a thing that just happened, and I said, Well, but I wasn't aware that I was mindful of it. I was aware of everything, but there was no mindful place, it seemed like. It's talking about should I come back to a mindful? I don't understand exactly what happened. Well, um, I could hear everything going on, and everything just went on. There was no labeling, there was no, there was no words thinking. 
No, no, no. The labels are not important. They're all, if you are aware of what's happening moment to moment, without identifying with it and without judging, just aware of sounds or thoughts or... I can't remember specific things. Right, that, that's exactly what happens. It's a very quick flow, right? You just don't want to be daydreaming. You don't want things to be happening unaware. In other words, you don't want thoughts to be coming and maybe five minutes later remember, oh, I've been thinking all this time. Because all that period is a state of sleep. It's just like dreaming. You know? But the awareness is very silent. Yeah, and you can just, with a very silent mind, watch that flow. But I find that, I, that I'm aware of going away. Once I become aware that I'm not on my breath, I think, oh, I've been thinking for some time. I'll be thinking about how long have I been thinking? And when I say thinking, it goes away, but I'm not aware of it happening from the beginning of the day. When the mindfulness gets strong, it picks up the first syllable of the first word. Just, just as the thought arises, and sometimes you can feel the thought coming even before it arises. You can, just, you can feel the movement of thought before it materializes. That's the kind of microscopic mindfulness that we're developing. Just instant to instant, that perfect clarity and luminosity of mind. To be, so that everything is very, very distinct. Just instant to instant, the mind is silently and very clearly aware. But it takes practice. It does not, you know, it takes this cultivation. One shouldn't stifle the arising of the thought. There's no, it's choiceless awareness, right? Whatever comes, simply to notice it. Suzuki Roshi, in his book, had one very nice phrase, which pertains very, uh, very much to this practice. He said, the best way to control a cow is to give it a very large pasture. Let the mind do what it wants to do, but be mindful. That's all. Wherever it goes, it, it's thinking the thought is okay. It's with the pain, it's with an emotion. Whatever comes, simply to be aware of it. Insight is developed from seeing impermanence, from seeing the arising and vanishing of all phenomena. Everything is impermanent, so it does not matter what the object is. You can develop insight on thoughts, on sensations, on emotions, because all phenomena share this characteristic of impermanence. So all we have to do is be aware of it, and then the wisdom is growing. I'm wondering about different relationships with the awareness of process. Um, does intellectual understanding of that process come along with the awareness of it, and other forms of understanding of the process? Depends on the person. Some, pe some people it does and some people it doesn't. People with very intellectual minds, generally in the course of practice, develop a good intellectual understanding. There are many people, especially in the East, the meditation centers, a lot of little old ladies come, really simple village people who, who've never studied anything, who don't know the theory, they come and the teacher tells them what to do and they do it and very quickly they get enlightened, you know, and they may not be able to express what happened at all. They may not have the conceptual framework to, to discuss it, but the experience is there and the purification is there. Yeah. So the understanding sometimes can be a hindrance? It can be if you get too involved with it, you know. Generally, Western is we're very intellectually oriented and want, you know, want everything clearly understood by the mind. So there's a lot of questioning, a lot of doubting. In the period of practice, that can be a hindrance, unless you make that the object of the meditation. Because unless you can remain mindful of that process happening rather than getting caught up by it. Maybe that's loving kindness exercise is not from setting this up. Diminishing our need to try to analyze it. Um, perhaps. Any other questions? Um, when you're being quote unquote mindful, how does the breath fit in? I mean, because like I'll be, 
you know, mindful and I away from my No, that's mind. okay. The breath is simply the primary object. In other words, when nothing much is happening. It's like your mindful. Right, right. It's the it's the central object. Except that in the breath, you can observe the process of rising and falling very clearly. In other words, it's more effective for the development of insight than a mantra, because the breath is a very clear process. Right? It's not it's not one thing. So you can be aware of the whole process of breathing, the flow of sensations involved. Right? It's the primary object in the sense that when nothing else is predominant. So the breathing is always there, right? You can always be, be developing mindfulness and insight with the breath. Sometimes thoughts are not there and emotions are not strong and the body's not doing much. So the breathing. But when something else is happening, there's no need to cling to the breath. Or it be with the flow of things, mindfully. But sometimes you may find that just to strengthen the mind, do you find the mind really scattered? Or... Then do, do the breathing as a concentration exercise. Spend a whole hour just on the breathing. You know, it sharpens the mind again so that it can be with the flow. What, what if you're having more than one thought at one time? Or, you know, well, obviously, a bit like this. Yeah. Just go with it. The, mindful, the mind is very quick. You can be right. When it's developed, there's, there's a flood of things happening. You know, but the mind is just silent and just right with it. When you're picking up so many things, that's when the labeling begins to fall away because there's no time, right? There's just too much happening. 